So we've been here to celebrate the, uh, the cause of liberty, and I'm here to deliver to you the bad news, which is you gotta wake up and smell the coffee because the cause of liberty is in trouble. Now first, some introductions. I'm Rob Trusinski, I'm here from the Atlas Society, which is the leading organization for engaging young people with the ideas of Ayn Rand, the 20th century novelist, philosopher, and pro-liberty icon. I'm also the editor, editor of Symposium, which is a publication I started with the goal of strengthening the intellectual foundations of a free society. And what I wanna to do today is combine those two things. I'm gonna talk about how and why we need to strengthen the arguments and ideas behind a free society and some of the big important ideas from Ayn Rand that we desperately need for that task. And desperately is the key word here because a free society is definitely under attack and the way I see it, the main, the main problem as I see it is that a lot of the people we used to be able to defend on to at least, depend on to at least defend some aspects of freedom have stopped doing that. They've given up on it. So when I was a kid, which was a few decades ago, but not exactly ancient history yet, it was the quote unquote liberals on the left who you would depend on to find fire breathing defenders of freedom of speech, people who crusade against book banning and disagree with everything you said, but fight to the death for your right to say it. Now, today what's happening? Well, what's happening is recently, when Abigail Schreier's book, Irreversible Damage, came out a few years ago, challenging the transgender orthodoxy of today, the ACLU's deputy director for transgender justice declared, quote, the necessity of stopping the circulation of this book and these ideas. So that's where we are in the age of wokeness. ACLU lawyers for book banning. So can we turn to the political right to defend our freedom? Well, right here in Florida, right now, Governor Ron DeSantis, supposedly the sane Trump, he has people arguing in the courts that the curriculum of public universities and even the in-class instruction, you know, the lectures given by professors, are not individual free speech but are instead government speech. It's all government speech that can then be limited, controlled, and directed by the government. And so his answer to censorship from the woke left is censorship from the anti-woke right. The due dominant strain on the right is nationalist conservatism. And uh, one of the leading, leading voices of nationalism, Yoram Hazoni, explains that it rejects the idea of, quote, the free and equal individual as the only thing that matters in politics. And this includes, he says, any variety of pro-freedom views, including neoliberalism, libertarianism, and what they call classical liberalism. Yeah, the, the contempt drips out of there. And the conservatives aren't even for free markets anymore. But surely, surely we can rely on the Libertarian Party to come to our rescue. Well, I think a lot of you might know how that's going. Just recently, the national leadership of the Libertarian Party was taken over and turned into kind of a, a soapbox for alt-right or alt-right adjacent voices. And the Libertarian Party, just when we might need somebody to be consistently in favor of liberty, it's, it's in free fall, it's collapsing. Now when you see a pattern this broad and persistent, you know it's not for trivial reasons. It is something general and pervasive that affects people of different factions, different interests, different positions in life. It's some kind of mind virus, an idea that's seeping in and making its influence felt everywhere. Or maybe it's better to say that this is the effect of the absence of ideas, certain key ideas that are necessary to defend a free society. And when those ideas are gone, we see this kind of general collapse happening in every direction. So my title today is Philosophy, Who Needs It? Which is borrowed from a great essay by Ayn Rand. I suggest you check it out. It's a quick search away on, on the interwebs. But notice there's no question mark in that title. It's not a question, it's a statement. Who needs philosophy is you. And what we've been talking about here is one of the reasons you need it. You need philosophical ideas, and by that I mean basic ideas about the nature of the world and the nature of human life. Because without answers to those big questions, how do we even know what we're trying to achieve or how to get there? My goal here today is to demonstrate the need for big ideas by highlighting three key ideas from Ayn Rand's philosophy that I think we need as infusions into the political, cultural, and philosophical debate. First, a little note on who Ayn Rand was. Like I said, she's a pro-liberty icon, so most of you have probably heard of her at some point. Some of you may have read her works. I just want to sketch a little bit about where she came from. So she was born in Russia. She saw the communists take over in the Soviet Union, 
as she escaped to America in 1926 and came here just in time for the red decade of the 1930s, when communism was the leading fashion among the intellectuals. And out of these experiences, she wrote her best-selling novel, The Fountainhead, which she described as being about individualism versus collectivism, not in politics, but in the soul. So it's about independence versus conformity, about the ability to set your own goals and use your own judgment versus just going with the flow and being whatever other people want you to be. Now, she followed that with the novel Atlas Shrugged, which portrays a fictional future America collapsing into a socialist dictatorship. It often sometimes does not entirely feel like fiction. But the novel is really about how it's not the bureaucrats, but the independent thinkers, the doers and creators, who actually keep everything going. They are the atlases who hold the world on their shoulders and everything collapses without them. Now, Atlas Shrugged cemented Ayn Rand's reputation as a leading defender of capitalism, but it wasn't just about politics. Her interest was in those basic ideas underlying capitalism. As she once said, quote, I am not primarily an advocate of capitalism, but of egoism. And by that, she means individualism. And I am not primarily an advocate of egoism, but of reason. Now, why does she start with reason? Well, that's the first big idea that we need as an infusion into the case for liberty. Reason is absolutely essential to any defense of liberty. To say that people should be free from coercion is to say that they should rely instead on discussion, negotiation, persuasion. It means they should reason with each other. There's a writer named Jonathan Rauch, a sort of old-fashioned center-left liberal, but someone who's also been a critic of wokeness. And he, he was a critic of it way back when we called it political correctness. And he wrote a really worthwhile book recently called The Constitution of Knowledge, where he describes the institutions we have in a free society that make sure that things are discovered, are, are settled by debate and persuasion, and not just by some top-down authority. And he made a really interesting point. He said that if you ask the average person, say, 300 years ago, who should decide certain big questions? Like, who should, who should decide what's true? Who should decide who rules? The least obvious answer would have been no one in particular. And yet that's exactly the system that we adopted. Who decides who rules? No one in particular. We all get a vote. Who decides what's true? No one in particular. Each of us gets to decide it individually. And this has been spectacularly successful. The amount of human knowledge has grown exponentially since we decided that no one in particular was in charge of it. And yet even defenders of the system often end up making concessions when it comes to the philosophical foundations of reason. So Jonathan Rauch, there's a reason I chose him. Jonathan Rauch wrote in this same book that the problem is that, quote, humans have no direct access to an objective world independent of our minds and senses, unquote. So we have to stop thinking about an external, if unknowable, world out there. Instead, we should think of truth as social, as coming out of the social systems we create. Knowledge, truth, is social. Now, this is a surprisingly common view, even among people who think they're defenders of reason, who are opponents of sort of woke orthodoxy and the woke attack on, re on reason. And so I think it's no wonder that we're not winning that battle, because this is exactly this idea that truth is social is exactly the idea behind wokeness and critical theory, what's, what's called critical theory in philosophy. It's the idea that we can't see things as they really are, only as they appear to us given our preferences and biases and our position in society. Truth is socially constructed. That's the phrase they use. And if truth has been constructed one way, it can be reconstructed any way you like. So, you know, Bruce Jenner is a woman if we all just decide to pretend that he is. If we all accept that all we have is just our perspective on reality based on our identity, and if we take that to its logical conclusion, then instead of finding common ground, we will divide into tribes, each living our own truth based on our subjective lived reality. Any attempt by somebody else to understand our reality and see it from our perspective will be regarded as futile or even unwelcome. And you'll see that sometimes denounced as appropriation, an outsider's intrusion into our group's exclusive truth. Now, I shouldn't have to tell you what that's like because this is the daily reality of arguing about just about anything in this age of wokeness. So what is the answer? That we need a stronger defense of our ability to arrive through reason at objective and universal truths. Now, when I read these timid contemporary defenders of reason, I find myself wishing they would take a page out of Ayn Rand and simply assert that reason is valid simply because A is A. 
Now this, Ayn Rand has become associated with this phrase, A is A, but it, she took it from the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle, uh, quoting one of his formulations of the law of identity. A is A means things are what they are. Facts are facts. A thing is one thing today and another thing tomorrow, depending on your perspective or how you feel about it or your membership in some marginalized group. As she put it, all the disasters that have wrecked your world come from your leader's attempts to evade the fact that A is A. Now, for example, like something contemporary, they pass a bill that pumps massive amounts of free money into the economy, and then they name it the Inflation Reduction Act. Right? Our politicians keep trying to pretend that A is not A, and reality keeps coming back to bite them. Now, if we're all dealing with the same immutable facts, if A is A, if things are what they are, we should be able to reach a common understanding about those facts. But what about our perspective on the facts? Do we only have access to our own distorted perspective, not the facts themselves? Is it the real world out there just beyond our grasp? Now think about the old story of the blind men and the elephant. This is an old fable from India, and the idea is that a deputation of blind scholars set out to try to find out what an elephant is, but they have to do it by feel, right? So one grabs hold of the trunk and says, it's like a giant snake. Another encounters the leg and says, it's like a giant tree. Another touches the tusk and says, it's hard and sharp like a spear, and so on. Now, are the three blind men out of touch with reality? Well, no, each one is correct as far as he goes. And you could use this story to conclude that everything is subjective and just depends upon your point of view, except that A is A. They are all touching the same elephant, and the elephant is the same no matter what. Now, this is a metaphor, so what's it a metaphor for? And that is that reality, so to speak, is the elephant in the room. Uh, we are all they're all touching the same elephant. We are all touching the same reality. So what would the blind men do if they remember that A is A? Well, they would talk to each other. They would say, this is what my part of the elephant is like. How about yours? Let's compare notes, let's switch places, let's see if we can piece together the full picture and discover what this thing is. By contrast, what's the one thing that would prevent them from understanding the elephant? Well, if they actually believed that there was no real elephant out there, if each thought that they just accepted that they were doomed to have only their own perspective. But that's exactly what we're doing today. And we're training people to cling to their own truth and their lived reality or their social network of tradition on the right, and to reject anything outside of it. Because A is A, we're all dealing with the same reality, and it's possible to know the truth, but we can know it only through a process. Now, if it's the blind men and the elephants, the process is talking to each other, comparing notes. This part's like a snake, this one's like a tree, etc. In the real world, the process is our process of discussion, debate, scientific investigation. It's the process of reason. And if we want to be in contact with reality, if we want to know what's actually going on in the world around us, we have to use and respect that process. Now, I should point out that in most of the cases today where people want to shut down freedom and shut down discussion, the issue was not really that complicated. Probably the best example is like transgender athletes, where you have a man who basically puts on a dress and demands to be able to compete against women in running or swimming or, or God help us, weightlifting. And then he wipes out a whole field of female competitors because the performance advantages that men have are so big that they're completely obvious to anyone who's not sabotaging his own brain. But we saw earlier how even the more sensible people, like Jonathan Rauch, the people who are trying to defend reason, are taken in by this argument about how we can't really know the real world out there and all we have is our perspective and social consensus. And those arguments are used to get people to sabotage their own brains and refuse to see the obvious. Now, this is Ayn Rand's central argument for a free society, the need to respect the process of reason. A rational mind, she wrote, does not work under compulsion, it does not substitute its grasp of reality to anyone's orders, directives, or controls. It does not sacrifice its knowledge, its view of truth, to anyone's opinions, threats, wishes, plans, or welfare. Such a mind may be hampered by others. It may be silenced, prescribed, imprisoned, or destroyed. It cannot be forced because a gun is not an argument. Now, to put that in today's context, you could force someone to go through the motions of repeating a diversity statement in order to get a job. 
Or you can browbeat him into posting a cringing apology that he doesn't really mean on social media. But you can't make someone understand or believe it. You can make people conform, but you're not going to convince them, and you're not going to produce knowledge. So the philosophical case for rationality, the fact that A is A, is essential to the defense of liberty. Now, the purpose of reason, the reason we need to be able to free to use it, is to guide our actions, to know what to do. And the purpose of our actions is to achieve our goals. The purpose is the pursuit of happiness. And that's another key idea for the defense of liberty that has largely been lost, the idea that our goal is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The pursuit of happiness means the individual defining and pursuing his own goals. It means pursuing prosperity and individual well-being. In the era of America's founding fathers, this was part of a widely accepted ethics that was called enlightened self-interest or self-interest properly understood. So in 1832, Alexis de Tocqueville comes to America. He writes Democracy in America. And in there, he observed that, quote, the doctrine of self-interest properly understood is not new, but among the Americans of our time, it finds universal acceptance. And he talked about how the Americans used it to explain everything they do by, by reference to self-interest properly understood. And you can see that if people are free to make their own decisions, they will be free to choose and pursue their own interests, their own ideas about their own happiness. Being free means to be able to say, this is what I want to do. By contrast, if self-interest is essentially evil, if you require everyone to sacrifice his own interests, if you think everyone has to suffer for your vision of the good of society as a whole, well, you're going to have to use coercion to force them to do it. Yet this is the most commonly accepted idea of morality today. So after Tocqueville's time, the doctrine of self-interest properly understood was replaced by a philosophy of altruism. Now altruism, as it's often used today, just means anything you do to help another person. Sorry, I'm lost. My pages stuck together. It just, people think it just means being nice. But that's not what the philosophy of altruism originally meant, and that's not how it was applied as a social system. The term altruism was coined in the early 19th century by a French philosopher named Auguste Comte, and the word literally means otherism. Comte summed it up in French in the motto, vive pour autrui, to live for others. And he meant that in a total way. Everything you do should be done solely for the good of others, and you should eliminate any interests or goals of your own. Now, if you think about what that means in practice, you find a basic contradiction. If our goal is to serve the interests of others, what are the others here for? Is it okay for them to have interests and want to be happy, but not for you? Well, in comp system, it's not okay. They should be living for others too, but then you have a system where everybody's sacrificing for someone else, and that person is sacrificing for someone else, and that person, you know, and so on. You get the idea. In The Fountainhead, Ayn Rand's villain sums up the absurdity of this system, the insanity of it. The consistently altruist future, her villain says, is, quote, a world where no man will hold a desire for himself, but will direct all his efforts to satisfying the desires of his neighbor, who will have no desires but to satisfy the desires of his next neighbor, who will have no desires around the globe. Let all sacrifice and none profit. Let all suffer and none enjoy, unquote. Now, he's in favor of this, and that's what makes him the bad guy. And he's in favor of it because he understands that when you tell people to sacrifice for the good of society, it's very easy for someone like him to make himself and his goals synonymous with society. Now, here's another quote. This is sort of Ayn Rand speaking to us through her villain. He says, it stands to reason that where there's sacrifice, there's someone collecting sacrificial offerings. Where there's service, there's someone being served. The man who speaks to you of sacrifice speaks of slaves and masters and intends to be the master. Now, there's been some discussion recently about what people call pathological altruism or toxic charity, where somebody you know, makes a big show of doing something for the good of others and actually makes everybody worse off. Well, nobody examined the pathologies of altruism more thoroughly than Ayn Rand, but her argument is that altruism is always pathological because at its root is the idea that nobody has a right to pursue happiness. How could that idea achieve any result other than making people miserable? Now, what's the alternative? 
We come into existence in this world with the capacity to build and create and to achieve our happiness and well-being. And what we need to know is, as Ayn Rand put it, that your life belongs to you and the good is to live it. Now, Ayn Rand was an advocate of rational self-interest. So it's not just about doing whatever you feel like. It's not a philosophy of hedonism. Ayn Rand was not a hippie. It's about rationally assessing your long-term interests. And it's not about trying to live by exploiting other people, which she saw as just the flip side of altruism. What she advocated was a morality in which you don't sacrifice yourself to others, and you don't sacrifice others to yourself. It's the ideal of people being independent and self-supporting and dealing with each other by consent where their interests overlap. Her hero in The Fountainhead puts it this way, the choice is not self-sacrifice or domination. The choice is independence or dependence. So what's really in our self-interest, our rational self-interest, is to be free individuals in a free society. Now this is a tremendously, this, this critique of altruism is a tremendously liberating idea because most people actually live by rational self-interest as they're working philosophy in everyday life. They choose a career, they make money, they buy houses and cars, they support themselves and their families, they pursue their own self-interest, and they do it not by robbing banks or swindling little old ladies, but by being productive and actually doing something or creating something. But you're still supposed to feel guilty about this because you are not sacrificing yourself to all the socially approved causes. So in defending the morality of self-interest, Ayn Rand set out to rescue people from that sense of unearned guilt. Now, when people are out there pursuing their rational self-interest, not only are they not hurting anyone, they're actually doing more to improve everyone's lives than all the altruists put together. Who is it that lifted developed countries out of poverty? The people who invented the steam engine, the factory assembly line, who railroads, power plants, computer networks, and everything else. And that's the third big idea that I want people to focus on, the role of the producers. And this is an area where Ayn Rand's contribution was not just as a philosopher, but as a novelist. The heroes of her novels are builders, inventors, creators. They, in The Fountainhead, it's an architect and artists. In Atlas Shrugged, they're scientists, inventors, entrepreneurs, people who are, invent new kinds of steel or run a railroad. She took this kind of work, the work that actually built the modern world, and she glamorized it. She romanticized it. She presented it as an adventure, a crusade. She wrote it as an epic. When we talk about rational self-interest, this is what she sees as the substance of self-interest, picking something productive and going out and coming up with new ideas and building new things and making the modern world. Obviously, this was part of Ayn Rand's defense of capitalism because she was glorifying the capitalists, the entrepreneurs and investors. But the politics of it is secondary. And that's one of the biggest things I think people need to get from Ayn Rand. Too many people on both sides today load all of their expectations onto politics. The left believes there can be no real progress and nobody's life could ever get better unless they pass another law and then another after that and another after that. And they go into absolute despair whenever they don't have a majority. Meanwhile, actual improvements to human life come from people who are not in politics and are just in inventing and making new things. But this has also affected the right, which is focused on seeking government power to fight the culture wars. And people act as if the world's going to be saved if they just own one more lib on social media. Ayn Rand's answer to this, all of this lies in her glorification of productive work. In place of a culture of, uh, she offered a culture of achievement in which work and innovation are what give life its meaning and value. The power of this vision is radical, should not be underestimated. And it's radical in part because it shows the need for philosophy and for a worldview, not just for politics, but for your own personal life and the choice of personal goals. Like the choice of what kind of work you're going to do and how you're going to do it. I want to leave you with one final thought from Ayn Rand. It's, it's less a philosophical idea than an attitude to ideas. So in Atlas Shrugged, there are two characters who are talking, and one of them is struggling with a, a new idea that he, he, he can't refute it, but he feels like he shouldn't. Uh, he, you know, it's, it's going too far that he can't really accept it. And one of the other characters said to him, remember, there are no evil ideas, no evil thoughts except one, the refusal to think. Now, let me repeat that. There are no evil thoughts except one, the refusal to think. 
Now, we live in an era of evil thoughts, of ideas you're not supposed to think about. And certainly, Ayn Rand provided a lot of ideas that might seem radical or off limits, like defending self-interest. But her point is that the greatest sin would be not to consider these ideas, to just accept whatever conventional notion other people tell you you're supposed to repeat. This is the deepest reason you need philosophy, not just to win arguments in favor of liberty, as worthwhile as that is. It's to know in your own mind what you're doing and why. Being able to grapple with these big ideas and think about them for yourself is essential to becoming a human being and not just somebody else's sock puppet. All right, so I'll end with a passage from Ayn Rand that really sums up this message. She wrote, quote, nothing is given to man on earth except the potential and the material on which to actualize it. The potential is a superlative machine, his consciousness, but he has to discover how to use it and he has to keep it in constant motion. The material is the whole of the universe with no limit set to the knowledge he can acquire and the enjoyment of life he can achieve. But everything he needs or desires has to be learned, discovered, and produced by him, by his own choice, his own effort, by his own mind." Unquote. That's what it means at root to be free, and that's the challenge Ayn Rand puts to you. So thank you for listening.